Tractate Brachis, page three, side A. Uh, we have just learned about the um, the three mishmaris, the three watchings that it says not only are in heaven, but we have a symbol of them here on earth, and. The Gemara gave uh, the three signs of when each of these watchings take place. And the Gemara brought a verse, Rabbi Eliezer brought a verse to prove that there are three watchings. And what was that verse that he brought? It was from Jeremiah, and it says, Hashem from heavens cries out, and from his holy abode he gives his voice and he cries and he cries double term cry for his temple and uh and then it gives us the sign so the verse said three uh three times crying and the way we're understanding it is that it's telling us that hashem cries three times and the reason why hashem cries three times is because the three the the three different changes of the watches are the same are those three times that hashem is crying over his temple uh over our temple and so that those cries are all hinted to in the word shoig which means to cry and the three times that uh we uh we can know when the change of these watches are or when these watches take place in heaven. So it's when the donkey brays, when the dogs uh, howl, and when the child nurses from his mother and a woman speaks with her husband. And um, the Gemara had asked a few questions, like what are, we, what are we referring to when we're saying these symbols of the changes of the of the watches why do we need a sign for the beginning of the night and why do we need a sign for the end of the night so if we're talking about the beginning sign so then the first one is is not necessary if we're talking about the end of the night the end of each of the watchings so then the last one is not necessary so we only really need two uh two two signs not three and uh, the gemara gave two answers to this question the first answer the Gemara gave was that we're talking about the end of the first watching, the beginning of the last watching, and the middle of the middle watching. And the understanding is that uh, these are the times when it's especially appropriate to cry over the, the, the Beis HaMikdash. Uh, the end of the first watching is the beginning, which means the beginning of the second watching. And we have the, the uh, beginning of the last watching. So at the, the beginning of the second watching, the beginning of the last watching are uh, a very appropriate times to cry over the Beis HaMikdash. And midnight is also an opportune time to cry over the Beis HaMikdash. Um, there are other commentaries that uh, say the midnight one is not exactly for crying over the Beis HaMikdash. It's, it, it's a sign in general to know when midnight is because there are halachic, ramifications to know when midnight is, for example, to know when to uh, finish saying the Shema, like our Mishnah says, to know when to finish eating the, um, um, the, the sacrifices and so on. So there are, uh, it could be there's other reasons for the midnight time, but uh, the simple reading of the Gemara would imply that we are trying to figure that there's, there's some connection between the, the, the watches and uh, knowing these signs, so it would, it would seem like they're, you know, the idea of crying over the Beis Hamikdash would be especially appropriate at midnight as well. Midnight would be also an opportune time to cry for the Beis Hamikdash. Uh, I'm not sure if this is connected, but maybe you could connect it with the idea that uh, exactly at midnight is when was Makas Bechiris, and maybe there's some connection there with the. Uh, redemption, um, you know, that started at midnight. Maybe that that could be a uh, a connection here. I, I didn't see it anywhere, so I'm just. And the Gemara, interestingly enough, will talk about that idea of uh, the fact that the redemption 
in a certain sense started at midnight uh, later. It doesn't really connect it to this to the to to, to here this idea of the of the watchings, but um, in any event, the, uh, the, the, the those are the three times. That's the first answer that the Gemara gives. Uh, this Rabbi, thing, yes, Rabbi. It isn't it true there are a lot of things happen at Chatzos? Chatzos seems to be a significant time in general. We say uh, on Pesach. So is Chatzos considered a especially auspicious time in some ways? Um, I mean, what, what other event besides Makas Bechirais in the redemption are you referring to? Let's think about it. What, what other events happened at Chatzos? Trying to remember from the Seder. Um... Don't we say that in broad daylight, which was Chatzos in the daytime, that uh, Hashem uh, but, said, oh, you know, you, you're, you're going to try to save, you're going to try to stop the Yidin from going out, you're going to try to stop Noach from doing the, right. the, 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 the marble, the flood, right, the, the ark? Yeah. Good point, good point. And, and also by Avram Avinu, they say, Hashem said, you're going to circumcise. We're going to stop him. And Hashem said, "You're going to stop him. I'm going to do it in the middle of the day." Chatzos. So generally, that's right. Good point. Good point. It says in the Torah three times, "Be'etzem hayoyim hazeh," in the essence of this day. So that's the the mid midday uh, chatzos, uh, and one of them was Nayach, uh, and the flood. One of them was the be'etzem hayoyim hazeh. It says about uh, Moshe Rabbeinu passing away that Moshe passed away exactly at midnight, and then you have the, um, the leaving of the, the Yidden left Egypt exactly, which is a little unclear if it was also exactly. Also the, the, the time of Avram Avinu's bris. In Betzamayamazah, right, in Avram's bris, Betzamayamazah. Betzamayamazah, Nimal Avraham Bishmal Benay, it says. In the midst of this day, Avraham and Yishmal were circumcised. So, uh, yeah, that's good. Good point, Howard and David. Uh, it's good, nice to put put this uh, this idea together. Um, that Chatzos has some uh, Howard, special. Howard, um, uh, Av Avram had it. How did Avram have his bliss uh, at midnight? I thought this was a day mitzvah. No, no, no. We're we're talking about midday. Midday and midnight, there's a connection between. We, we were talking about the the the, the uniqueness of chatzos, and in in in, in Tyra, there's two chatzoses. Every there's a chatzos of the day and chatzos of the night. So uh, once we were talking about chatzos of the night and the uniqueness of it, we were mentioning that there's uh, you know that possible that there's something special about the whole concept of chatzos, and we were, David brought up the idea that the day chatzos has some unique qualities to it. So uh, definitely an interesting, uh, you know, something to look into if, if chatzay, well, you know, what the, this uniqueness of chatzayis is, especially the, 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 the goyim consider chatzayis as a, as a major um, change between the two days. So the fact that it's, it, you know, it, there is such a, um, it, you know, there is such a, um, a thought, even though it's not a Jewish, even though we don't follow the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the fact that the day changes at midnight, but it could be that it has some source in Yiddishkeit, which causes in the world to have some outcome that the Goyim at least uh, follow that, that idea. Um, so uh, th there might also be halachas that are applicable to midday. For example, uh, davening shachris is only by until midday. You know there are there are idea there are halachas and we, we see that the rabbis established shema until midnight, so you know the, it definitely seems like a uh, um, there must be some source in spiritual realms that cause the the mid to have um, have certain energy that 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 would uh, would would have an effect would would affect the halacha would it would possibly cause uh, cause in the world that the goyim would you know, catch on to this. Okay. Thank so, you. Emma. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for bringing it up, Howard. So the um, the Gemara continues here. So did we say the, the second answer? The final answer was the, what was the final answer of the, the the second answer? The second answer of the Gemara was that we're talking about 
the end of the Mishmaris. So why did they give these signs for the last, why did they give a sign for the last one when we'll know that it's day? And the answer is because a person might be sleeping in a dark room and he would not, um, would not know when the time of, would not know when it's light. So he can rely on these signs and he'll know that the, the, uh, the Mishmaris in heaven um, have changed and that causes, and that will be uh, the same time, that will be the time of uh, when, when the night ends and the day begins. And that would be that he'll know when he hears when either the women are speaking to their husband or the child is nursing from his, from his mother. So he'll know that it's time to get up and get ready to say Shema. So that was the uh, conclusion of the Gemara, why we need, why we would need these times. So it's it's interesting that the Gemara does mention that there's mishmaris in heaven and um, mishmaris on earth. Uh, the, what was the term that the Gemara used? Ika mishmaris berakia, ika mishmaris ba'ara. What it seems like is that the fact that the heavenly watchings change. It has an impact on Earth, maybe that causes, you know, uh, either the 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 uh, the donkey's bray, the 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 um, the dog's uh, howl, and um, maybe the the child wakes up. Maybe there's some cause that this maybe spiritually it causes these changes in the physical world uh, in, uh, that that we live in based on these changes of the Mishmaris. It seems like there's some connection there that it causes that. Um, uh, and, and so uh, maybe uh, the Isha Misaparis and Baila, she speaks to her husband. Maybe there's like, she wakes, people wake up then. They, they you know, they, um, so it seems there's some connection. It's not just a sign. In other words, the Gemara doesn't just say, and, and the sign for it happens to be this. It's, it's sort of like a, uh, an outcome almost of the Mishmaris in heaven. So it definitely is something to, uh, to you know, it's an interesting point that it seems that the Gemara is hinting to some connection there between these heavenly Mishmaris and the earthly Mishmaris. Okay, we're going to continue now. The Gemara that we're about to continue is uh, exactly in the middle of the page. And it starts with the word Amar Rav Yitzchak. Must be about 20 lines down from the top and maybe 20 lines up from the bottom, approximately. So we're Amar Rav Yitzchok Bar Shmuel. Rav Yitzchok Bar Shmuel said, Mishmei de Rav in the name of Rav. Gimel Mishmarois Havi Halaila. There are three Mishmarois in the night. The night is made up of three mishmaris. The alkol mishmaru mishmar, and on all of these mishmars, on all of these watchings, Yoishev Hakadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem sits v'shoyeg kaari, and he cries like a, or he roars like a lion. Ari is a lion. V'aymer, and he says, Oy labanim, woe is to the sons, sheb avinay sehem, that with their sins hecharavti yaspesi. I destroyed my house, and I burned my sanctuary, and I uh, exiled them between the nations of the world. So the, uh, the statement of Rabbi Yitzchak Bar Shmuel says that continues along these lines that there's three mishmaris, there's three watchings, but he also emphasizes this fact that Hashem, on each of the mishmars, Hashem is um, lamenting, and over the Beis HaMikdash, and over our situation, that uh, the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. It's interesting that he says it in two, he uses two terms, hecharavti yas beisi, besarafti yas hecholi, I destroyed my house, 
and I burned my heichal. Uh, it, it would seem it's the same thing, destroy, destroy the base amigdash. But the, uh, the uh, Chaim explains that there's, that number one, Hashem removed his, um, his holiness from the Beis HaMikdash, and then the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. So the, it divides it in two, because it, number one is, is it, it, Hashem, so to speak, took away the spirituality, uh, 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 took away his holiness, and then number two, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, destruction, the destruction happened. Of course, you know, it, it's interesting to, uh, to see such an explanation because uh, it would seem like this gets into uh, 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 another debate that's discussed in the Talmud if uh, the, the holiness of the Beis Hamikdash stays even after it's destroyed. And here, you know, the, the, this commentary is trying to explain that Hashem removed his holiness and then the Beis Hamikdash was destroyed. So does this enter, does this bring us into that other debate, like why the, the Gemara is using this term, or does this opinion follow that view? But there is such a the discussion later, you know, in other places in the Talmud, brought up a, a number of places if, if they're, uh, you know, if the holiness um, left the place where the Beis Hamikdash is, or to what extent of the holiness, of course, there might be different levels of the, of the holiness that, you know, of Hashem's holiness that, that was removed. Um, anyway, Rabbi Smith. Yes. I was going to ask if Shehech, um, the word Charavti, uh, the, 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 um, the Shorish is Charev, a knife, and the story with the, uh, the, 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 the knife was stabbed into the Parochus in the base of Mikdash. Uh-huh. 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 Very, very, uh, very interesting. Now, hmm, that's an interesting thought. David is, is, is talking about uh, the story of um, the um, Titus Harasha. He uh, stabbed the Parochas, and was it was it Titus, uh, Harasha that 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 stabbed the Parochas? David, do you remember if it was the the first base of Migdash or the second base of Migdash? Not sure. I'm trying to think. Um, and it says that blood came out of the Parochas, as if Hashem, uh, you know. Uh, uh, as if that was Hashem's essence, so to speak. And uh, uh, basically, um, you know, maybe it, it first, you know, it was desecrated, so to speak, and then it was destroyed, which, which really could be more, you know, on a, on a simple level, right? You could really explain it. It was first desecrated um, and um, um, degraded, uh, before it was before before it was destroyed, even not e even not the idea that Hashem removed His holiness, but the fact that it was um, it was uh, made it was it was embarrassed. It was made into a, a you know it was desecrated so that 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 you know that that that's how that itself is considered like a destruction. Um, I believe there's another explanation here. Charavtius uh, Basi. Oh, that there's a Beis Hamikdash below and a Beis Hamikdash above. That's another explanation. That there is a Gemara that says that there's a heavenly Beis Hamikdash and an earthly Beis Hamikdash, and um, that's why it's referring to both. That the the Beis Hamikdash below is corresponds to the Beis Hamikdash above. So when they destroyed the Beis Hamikdash below, it basically caused the Beis Hamikdash above to be destroyed, and um, and that's why it uses a double terminology. Um, which is connected to the third base amigdash because we know every time we do a mitzvah, we're actually adding on a brick to the third base amigdash, but we don't see it because it's in heaven. And that's why it says there's the whole discussion uh, who's going to build the third base amigdash. It's there are contradictory uh, statements about the third base amigdash. Is it going to be built by us, by Mashiach, by um, by Hashem? So the 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 re way to reconcile it is that really the base amigdash is already built. Hashem is just going to lower it down from heaven. It's already built, and we or Mashiach we're going to put on a door 
to the base Hamikdash. We're going to just do the final touch. So it's going to be considered like we what we built it, Hashem built it, and so on. It, everything is reconciled. But that's the idea that there is a a base Hamikdash above that's uh, just waiting. It's just re- it's ready for us to be to to ready for uh, for to be to 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 come down. It also mentions that um, a kohen. There is an opinion that a kohen is not allowed to drink wine. Uh, and the reason is because what happens if the Beis Hamikdash is rebuilt and he's needed to do the Avodah? And uh, the question is, what do you mean? He's drinking wine now. By the time the Beis Hamikdash is rebuilt, you would think that it would take, uh, you know, he would have time to uh, to get over his, uh, not only his drunkenness, he'll even be well over his uh, hangover uh, by the time the Beis Hamikdash is built. But the answer is no, the Beis Hamikdash is already built. It's just going to be dropped down from heaven. It could take one second. And uh, and therefore, according to one opinion in the Gemara, a Kayin is not supposed to drink wine. Of course, we don't follow that. But that would be the logic behind that opinion is that that it's possible for it to be rebuilt in a, in a moment. So that's the idea that there's a heavenly base Hamikdash and an earthly base Hamikdash. Okay, now we're going to continue. We're up to the two dots in the Gemara. And we're at the, the uh, last word on the line. It says Tanya. Tanya, we learned in a brisa. Amar Rabbi Yossi. Rabbi Yossi says, Pa'am achas, one time, Hoyisi mahalech baderach. I was going in the way, on the way, v'nechnasti l'chor achas. And I entered l'chorva. I wonder how the... Uh, do they put achas with lechorva or achas mechorvas? I think achas goes with mechorvas Yerushalayim. I entered to a chorva, to a, um, chorva is a ruin. Achas mechorvas Yerushalayim, one of the ruins of Jerusalem. Lehispalel, to Davin. Ba Eliyahu, and Elijah came. Zachor Latoiv, who's remembered for good. And he waited for me at the door. It's interesting that whenever that often or sometimes when we say Eliyahu, we say Zohar Latoiv. It's remembered for good. And uh, the other time that we find Zohar Latoiv besides for Eliyahu is Vagam uh, Charvoina Zohar Latoiv at the end in Purim, at the end of Shoshanis Yaakov, we say. So there, there is a medrash that says that it wasn't Charvaina who was a servant of Achashverosh. It was really Elijah dressed up like Charvaina. So therefore, Vagam Charvaina Zachar Latoiv, and also Charvaina is remembered for good. It really means Elijah. It's a hint that it was really Elijah who was dressed up like Charvaina in the time of Purim. That he was the one who was really he dressed up like who was in the. In the body shape and the in the dress, he dressed up like Charvaina. He looked like Charvaina in order to uh, get the king to hang Haman. So it was really Elijah, and that's why it says over there, Zachar Latoiv. In any I'm event, a, we mentioned a, here. Rabbi Smith, I believe Eliyahu never really died, according to uh, Midrashim, right? Well, he he he, uh, he right. He went up to heaven and he comes back. Yeah, yeah, correct. I mean, he went okay. up to heaven alive and. Uh, uh, in a uh, you know a fiery uh, cloud, and uh, comes down to every bris. He's here on Pesach night, and uh, it seems like the authors of the Gemara or the, the here this is a brisa. So the authors of the of the Mishnah in brisas they they seem to have a relationship with Elijah. There are numerous stories about Elijah studying with them or talking to them, and um, you know and and uh, so. Uh, they obviously were on a very high level, of course, to be able to uh, to uh, to see Elijah. And it see, doesn't seem like he was quite, he was nervous. It seemed like it was a, a regular thing. I was there and uh, uh, Elijah waited for me. So uh, in any event, this story uh, is, uh, Rabbi Yossi is saying that he went into this, he was going on the way and he entered a, um, a ruin uh, in Yushalayim and uh, to Davin. And Elijah came and he waited for him. And Ad Shasiyamti Tfilasi. Until I finished my prayer, he waited. Allah Shasiyamti Tfilasi. After I finished my prayer, Amar Ali, he said to me, Shalom Allah Rebbe. 
He said, peace be, be upon you, Rebbe. And I answered back to him, Shalom Alecha Rebbe Umayri. Peace upon you, my master and my teacher. And he said to me, my son, because of what? Did you enter this ruin? And I told him to Davin. And he told me, you should have davened on the way, on the road. Uh, you shouldn't have entered this ruin. And I told him, I was nervous. Maybe the uh, passerbyers will interrupt me. And Elijah told me, You should have davened a short tefillah. The Gemara later talks about a short tefillah that uses two tight. There are two tefillahs that are considered a short tefillah. One is um, a very short tefillah. It's called Merubim Tzarchei Amcha Vadaitam Katsara. It's a very, very short uh, prayer. Um, and then there's another option of a tefillah, a katsara, short tefillah, which is called havinenu. Havinenu is a tefillah where you say the first three brachas of Shemayna Esrei, you say the last three brachas of the Shemayna Esrei, but the middle 19 brachas uh, are, are, are summarized into one, one bracha. So uh, that's called havinenu. It's, it's, it's a... Uh, it's definitely a lot shorter than the full Shemun Esrei. So Rashi over here uh, says it's Havinenu, even though normally the Gemara would use the term Havinenu. Taisvis is not satisfied with that because it says Tefillah Ketzara, which implies the other, the real short Tefillah. But in the final uh, analysis, uh, Taisvis uh, agrees that it must here must mean Havinenu. So even though the words normally mean Tefillah Ketzara normally means a short Tefillah, here it, uh, it seems like everyone agrees that it's Havinenu. It's this Tefillah called Havinenu, which is a abridged version of the full-fledged Men Esrei, where you say the full three brachas in the beginning, full three brachas at the end, and the middle is where you, you, you do a summary of all the, I'm not, I said a summary of 19 brachas, I'm sorry, a summary of the middle brachas of the, of the Shemena Esrei, uh, which is uh, uh, either 12 or 13 uh, brachas when they, they, they added a brach at the end. But that's the, uh, that's the called Havinenu. So that's what we're talking about here. So, did anyone say that, did anyone say that uh, anymore? It's, it's very uncommon to use Havinenu. Um, um, you know, because the, the reason is, the reason to say Havinenu would be if a person can't concentrate. And we don't concentrate any, any, any way so much in our prayers. So therefore the leniency, uh, you know, to say Havinenu is not so uh, practical now because, you know, we, anyway, we sort of daven and, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's not like we normally can do the regular, you know, the regular davening with full concentration. And, and this time we can't, we, we're, we're always in a limited uh, concentration situation. We're, we're limited with our ability. Um, and therefore, uh, we just, we always just say the regular Shemun Esri. But the later the Gemara will discuss the Havinenu. Um, but I, I don't believe that it's, that it's common. I actually wrote a little... Um, booklet for the, uh, the nursing homes that I service. And in that booklet, I put in the tefillah havinenu, because for the nursing homes, I felt is the only, uh, the, the people the people who are definitely not going to say a regular Shemun Esrei, uh, uh, you know, this is at least a, a possible, maybe, maybe they'll be able to say it. It's instead of, you know, 10 pages long, it's uh, two pages. So, for that, you know, it was like the only uh, thought that maybe they would, uh, you know, that would be uh, apropos for the, for the, for them. But other, uh, you know, and, and of course, you know, 
these are not people that normally daven because if they normally are used to davening, they probably would be able to continue saying the regular Shemun Esrei, but it's for people, it was for, meant for people who are not, not from, but they have time on their hand, but they can't concentrate, you know, it's really hard for them to concentrate for too long. So for them, I, I put in this Havinina, but it's definitely not common. And, it, and I don't know to give, per, you know, I, I don't know that anyone ever does it. If someone wanted to say Havinina, I definitely advise them to ask a Rav before they, uh, before they take uh, take on such a, uh, um, a heter, a leniency. Maybe people who are involved in the, uh, deeply in the work day, um, you know, they don't have that much time for a full, say a full mincha service, so they'll, they'll just say that much, they can say that much of the Shimona Esra, of Avinenu, maybe that's the way to satisfy the, the mincha service in the middle of a, in the middle of their work day. Well, it's a good question, Jerry. Um, I would think that a Rav would probably tell them to daven in English and say the whole Shemun Esrei in English rather than do the Habinenu. I really don't think that it's so acceptable anymore, the Habinenu. Um, so I, I doubt that they would uh, that they would give you a heter to do the Habinenu, but if, you know, it might be, so, you know, maybe, definitely uh, you're welcome to ask a Rav. Okay, so um, the Gemara continues here and it says, that uh, El- Eliyahu was telling Reb Yossi off for davening in this ruin. And he said that, um, you know, you shouldn't have uh, davened in the ruin. You should have davened on the, on the, the road. And uh, even though people will interrupt you, but if you daven at Tefillah Ketzara, it'll be much shorter. So you won't have to worry, uh, you know, about people interrupting you. And uh, that was the end of his conversation with Elijah. And Ba'isa Sha'ad, we're now on the second wide line. At that time, Lamadati Mimenu, I learned from him, Shleisha Devarim, three things. Lamadati, I learned, She'ein Nechnasin L'Chorva, person should not enter a ruin. Lamadati, and I learned, Shemespalim Baderach, that you can daven on the road, meaning even though uh, there is a preference to daven inside, um, and it will be learned later in the Gemara of Brachis, uh, that there is a preference to daven inside, but nevertheless, um, um, it is permissible to daven outside if you don't have a better option. And, And I learned the third thing, that a person who davens on the way should daven a tefillah ketzara, which we're learning means havinenu. Okay, so that's the three things that I learned from him. Now the Gemara jumps back into the conversation. So the conversation ended for a moment. We just said what he said. He learned three things from him. And now the Gemara continues with that conversation. Va'amar li, and Elijah said to me, Bini, my son, ma koil shomata b'chor vazu. What? Sound did you hear in this uh, ruin? The Almighty Loy and I said to him, Shamati Baskoil. I heard a Baskoil. A Baskoil is a heavenly voice, and um, what did the Baskoil uh, say? What was going? What, so it says Shemina Hemes Kayoina. It makes a sound like a dove. What? What? How does it translate Mina Hemes? Any, anyone have the English there? Minahemes. It's a, some type of a sound. Anyone? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Cooing yeah. like a dove. What, what is it? Cooing like Cooing. a dove. Cooing. Okay. So it cooed like a dove. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. Vaimeres oila banim. And so this, the sound was a, a basco, a heavenly voice that was cooing like a dove. And it was it said... Oy labanim, woe is to my to this to my sons, labanim to the sons, Sheba Abinaisehem, that with their sins, through their sins, Hecharafti Asbasi, I destroyed my house, Visarafti Asecholi, and I burnt my Hechol, I burnt my sanctuary, Vihiglesim Labain Haumais, and I exiled them between the nations. Ba'amar Li, and um, after I told this to Elijah. Elijah told me, um, 
Chayecha means by your life, and by the life of your head, means like I promise, Loisha Azubalvad, not only this time, Aimereskach, does it say this? Elabachol Yoim Vayoim, but every day, Sholish Pa'amim, three times, Aimereskach. The, uh, the, there is a heavenly voice that says this. So three times a day, there is a heavenly voice that cries out uh, about the uh, lamenting over the Beis Hamikdash, and El, uh, and not only this, Velozu Bolvad, and not only this, Ella, but. At the time that the Yidden enter a base hakneses, ulavate medrashos, and a base hamedrash, the time that the Yidden enter to these places, the, the a synagogue and a house of study, va'inin yehei shmei hagadol nevayrach, and the, the they answer that may Hashem's name, Hashem's great name, be blessed. HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mananea Roishai. Hashem moves his head, he, he, he uh, um, nods his head, V'oimer, and he says, Ashrei HaMelech Shemakal Sin Oisoi Bevesoi. Praised is a king that they would have, that this uh, praise would be in his house, meaning that the Beis Hamikdash would be built. Praiseworthy is the king, in other words, if only my Beis Hamikdash was built and I would hear the Yehesh Mei Hagadol, may his name be blessed, may Hashem's name be great, may they be praising me in my house like this. And then he says, Maloy Liav, what is to a father, Shehigla Esbanov, that he exiled his sons? And woe is to the sons, Shagolu, that have been exiled, Mial Shulchan, Aviyam from upon the, the, the table of their father. And so that is the uh, conclusion of this Gemara. Concludes at the two dots. That Yehesh May sounds like um, uh, the Yehesh May Rabba we say in the Kaddish. Yeah, yeah. So so it's interesting that the Gemara uses a different different word. It says Yehesh May Hagadol Mavayrach instead of Yehesh May Rabba, but it's basically the same thing. Now, um, the the Gemara says that when they say Yehishmei Hagadol Mavirach, so so Hashem nods his head every time that they hear Yehishmei Hagadol Mavirach. Hashem is like it. Hashem feels good in a certain sense, and he but he wishes that that would be in in uh, in, in the Beis Hamikdash that he would be feeling that praise. And um, uh, Tysus has an interesting. Uh, 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 he brings an interesting thing. He says that. During the time of exile, Hashem's name is uh, is not full. It says only when Amalek is destroyed is Hashem's name complete. The Yud and the Hey are separated from the Vav and the Hey. So, in order to, for Hashem's name to be complete, it says Ein Hakisi Shalim Ve'Ein Hashem Shalim Ad Ad Amalek. Hashem's name and his his throne is not complete until uh, Amalek is destroyed. And so, um, and that's, uh, there's a, a Pasuk says, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Hashem's, Hashem's throne is not complete until, uh, until, until we get rid of Amalek. Um, and um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the the, the sentence that we say Yehishmei Raba Mavarach, and one of the translations of it brought in the Machzar Vitri. Uh, one of the, the is the translation. Listen to this Yehishmei. Let the name Shmei means shame Yudke. Let the name Yudke be Mavarach or Yehishmei Raba. Let the name Yudke be complete, be whole. That the name Yudke should be complete with the Vavke. So, so according to the Machzer Vitri, a person should maybe have that in mind. Yehishmei Rabba, may may Hashem's name, may the name Yudke be complete. Uh, and then it says Mevayrach la'alam 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 la'
let it be, let it be everlasting. Let it, like, almost like two sentences. We say it in one sentence. Yesh me rabam varch we say like in one sentence, but if you want to divide, if you want to translate it like the Machsavitri, it's sort of divided into two sentences that Yehesh me Rabba, let the shame Yudke be Rabba be complete, Godol and Shalem, let it be big and complete. And uh, then Mavarach Lalam Ome Omaya, it'll be blessed forever, Lalam uh, Haba, you know, let it be blessed forever, everlasting. Um, but Tysus doesn't uh, doesn't like that shot because he says our Gemara seems to prove that that, that explanation is wrong. From the Machzor Vitri, because he says, "Look at how the Gemara says it: Yehesh me Hagadol Mevayrach," and it like a period, it, it, almost like Yehesh me Hagadol is connected with not not a period after Mevayrach, but it like continues uh, as if that's the full, as if that, as if the word Mevayrach is connected to the first half. Now, if you if you according to the Machzor Vitri, the word Mevayrach really is part of the second half of the sentence. And so it should just say Yehesh Mei Hagadol or Yehesh Mei. Actually, I, I, I take back what I just said. Let me let me let me use a different term. Uh, I think this is more correct. Um, Yehesh Mei Hagadol, because it has a hey there. Yehesh Mei Hagadol. If it was Yehesh Mei Raba, you could say that it means um, that it means. Hashem's name Yudke should be Rabba. But here it says Yeheshme Hagodol. It uses a hey before Hagodol. So it sounds like let the name which is Hagodol that is great and it's continuing the sentence. In other words, if it said Rabba, it could mean let it be great. But instead, of, in other words, Rabba would, would be a verb. Yeheshem Yudke Rabba. Let the name Yudke be, be, be complete, be, 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 be full, almost like a verb. Uh, it, it, the way it's, it's said in our Gemara is Yehesh Mei Hagodol, let the name, like an adjective, let the name that's great be Mevairach, be blessed. So it's not only from the word Mevairach that I initially said, it's actually from the He of Hagodol. Because the Gemara changes from the word Rabba, Rabba, you could translate as almost like a verb. It's a make the name of Hashem, Mavairach, be complete, be, let it be a full name. But here, because it uses the He, and it also, I think maybe it's both these ideas, uh, caused Taisvis to uh, say that, that you can't learn that shot uh, because the Gemara seems to, uh, seems to contradict it. Uh, the, way, the way the Gemara, um, you know, is, is the, the term the Gemara uses here. In any event, that is the uh, that is the Gemara. That is the story that Hashem, when uh, three times a day, and also whenever the Yidden say Yehishmei. Now, in a base medrash, it would seem that this would be a source for when they say Kaddish. Sometimes after people learn, after you have a minion of people studying Torah. Because that, that's when you say in a base medrash, the Yehesh Mei HaGadol Mavairach would be uh, from the Kaddish, which is after the, uh, the study of Torah. And um, I mean, obviously there are other sources for such a thing, but maybe that's what it's referring to. Uh, I'm not sure if all of the base medrashes in the olden days, if they would have synagogue services there as well, or would it just be for learning Torah? Uh, possibly, you know, possibly maybe they did. Uh, but if, if not, then this would be the reason why they're saying Kaddish there is because after they study Torah, if someone needed to say Kaddish, they would, they would do this rabbinical Kaddish after the, Torah, the study of Torah and uh, after their drushes. Tysus also gets into an, another interesting uh, discussion of why is Kaddish in Aramaic? Why isn't it in Hebrew? And um, Tysus says that people say uh, that the reason why it's in Aramaic is because it's such a beautiful prayer. We don't want the angels to be jealous. And there is a, a concept that angels don't understand Aramaic. So we say it in Aramaic, and this way the angels don't understand it, and they're not jealous. So it's such a, it's such a, so that's what, that's a, 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 a um, an explanation that the people say, Taisa says, the oilam, masha oimrim ha'ilam, but the world says this is the explanation why it's in Aramaic. Um, 
And Texas yes. on that also uh, disagrees. I'm sorry, you had a question, Jerry? Yeah. The first two words can sometimes be Hebrew uh, or it could be uh, Aramaic because the whole Kaddish is in Aramaic. Some people say Yitzgadal Vizgadash, and others say Yitzgadel Vizgadesh. Uh huh. And which one of those would be the Aramaic term, and which one would be the Hebrew? Yeah, one of them. Once I think Yitzgadal Vizgadash is the Hebrew, and Yitzgadel uh Vizgadesh -huh. would be the Aramaic. Uh huh. I Interesting, Jerry. I say I'm not so perfect in my uh, um, diktuk uh, knowledge. To know which that, that but that's a that's an interesting point. I wouldn't have known that. Yiskadel Yiskadash and Yiskadel Yiskadesh. Very interesting. In any event, the rest of the Kaddish is definitely Aramaic. Uh, no matter how you start the first two words, um, you know, it, it definitely uh, changes. Uh, you know, Shmei is definitely an Aramaic word. Uh, you know, it would be Shmoy in Hebrew. So um uh so Tysus doesn't like this explanation that um I'll tell you something funny. Someone once went to the Lubavitcher Rebbe and I told him, he said, why don't you study in your yeshivas uh, diktuk? Diktuk means, um, wh what's the English translation of diktuk? Grammar. Grammar. Why don't you study gr Hebrew grammar, proper Hebrew grammar, uh, 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 diktuk? So the Lubavitcher Rebbe said, dikduk. If you want to say it right, if you're really studying grammar, it's not diktuk, it's dikduk. <laughs> so the Lubavitcher Rebbe like corrected him. You're the one who's telling me that we should study dikduk, dikduk. <laughs> anyway, that's the. Uh... So Tysus over here he says that um, uh, uh, the reason why it's in Aramaic is because um, it says the whole world exists because of the Yehesh Me Rabbah which is studied after the uh, Gothic teachings of the Talmud, that, um, uh, which was like the drushes that were given. And the whole, it says the whole world stands on that, meaning it brings such pleasure to Hashem that the whole world is, is standing on that base of, these, of this of Kaddish. And there were many people that were ignorant in Hebrew. And uh, when the rabbis um, uh, formed the Kaddish, they wanted everyone to be able to understand it and especially because it says the whole world stands on this so that's why they 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 had it written they 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 authored it in um aramaic so everyone could understand it 